Dr. Jennifer Pollack is an Associate Professor and Chair for Coastal Conservation and Restoration at the Heart Research Institute. This is located at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. So through her research, Dr. Pollack aims to provide science-based information to support coastal research management and habitat conservation efforts. She and her team conduct extensive field research, including oyster reefs, salt marsh, and superlids, superlids? Superlid. Uh, superlid. Okay, I'm not an oyster person. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, reef habitats. So, um, if you are ready, please take it away. Okay, Danny, can you see my screen okay? Yes, it looks perfect. All right, great. Thanks so much for that introduction, and hello, good morning, everyone. So I'm going to pick up right where Sarah left off and talk about ecosystem services and benefits, not only of natural oyster reefs, but of reefs that we've restored to uh, replace some of the lost benefits that occur due to uh, habitat degradation and loss. So as Sarah explained, oysters are ecosystem engineers. So the way that a reef is formed is by the, the um, younger generations of oysters, the larvae, attaching on to a hard substrate. And typically in our bays, uh, the place where they're going to find the most reliable source of hard substrate is going to be the older generations of oysters and their shells. So the formation of a reef is typically the younger generations attaching onto the older generations that form these foundational building blocks that create this really complex three-dimensional habitat. And there are estimates that this surface area of an oyster reef is 50 times greater than that of the surface area of the flat bay bottom. Some of the research that we've been doing in our lab have, um, has given us some more information about what this means for enhancement of populations of organisms. And what we found is that if you restore just 10 square meters of reef, which is approximately 100 square feet of reef, you can produce an additional 11 kilograms or 25 pounds of stone crab per year just in that restored area, or two and a half kilograms, which is five and a half pounds of oyster toadfish per year. So stone crab are a commercial fishery, which is gonna allow some additional economic benefits. And I know that not everyone loves toad, uh, oyster toadfish, but we do know that they provide a reliable food source for things like dolphin, rays, and sharks as well. Oysters are also known for their, um, their role in, in water filtration. So sometimes we think of them as little mini water treatment plants. They do this because of their suspension feeding activities where they're feeding on phytoplankton and detritus in the water column. And as they do that, they're cleaning and clearing the bay waters naturally. Some of the work that we've done at the Heart Research Institute indicates that a one square kilometer of oyster reef can remove 500 kilograms of nitrogen per year or uh, via denitrification or 250 kilograms of nitrogen per year via burial and sediment. So that's moving some of that nitrogen that's captured in phytoplankton and detritus from the water column and then transferring it to the sediments where it's buried. So this can have some economic benefits as well in terms of removing potential excess nutrients within coastal waters. Oyster reefs, rather than just the oysters themselves, are also very well known for their potential to protect shorelines. So we know that these oyster reefs are like natural uh, breakwaters, if you will, and their presence can help stabilize a, uh, adjacent sediments as well as provide a buffer against wave energies that can reduce erosion of nearby habitats that may be more sensitive to erosion, things like uh, salt marshes. This area of research is definitely still ongoing and we're learning a lot about the capacity for oyster reefs to protect shorelines. So the research that's out there right now <clears throat> has been varied in the results that they found and the methods that they've looked at, but generally have found that shoreline retreat can generally be reduced by the presence of, of restored reefs, which is good because it can, help, help, it can also help um, reduce coastal vulnerability to things like storms. But a lot of this research is still ongoing because the results are really dependent on context. So for example, it depends if you're in a high energy environment or high energy shoreline versus a low energy shoreline, what the vertical relief of the reef is, what the water depth is, et cetera. So there's quite a bit of work that's been done on this and a lot that is, um, is going on into the future as well. This is a really big area of interest because of um, interest in living shorelines as a shoreline protection strategy. 
And then the last um, ecosystem service I want to focus on is that of, of carbon sequestration. So this is really a new area that has a lot of interest right now um, from folks from a lot of different groups. So oysters can take up CO2. Uh, they do this in a, in, a, in a couple of different ways. The, probably the easiest one to think about is that they're shell builders. So they're building their shells out of calcium carbonate. So some carbon is stored in their shells. But the other way that they do this is through their suspension feeding activities. Again, they're feeding on phytoplankton that are taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And so by consuming these phytoplankton and then transferring that carbon to the sediments, they are again capturing and storing carbon and removing it from circulation in the atmosphere. This again, like shoreline protection, is really an active area of interest and an active area of research because of, of varied results that have come out so far. So there are about a dozen papers that have looked at this and the estimates of the capacity of oysters to store carbon range all the way from, from oyster reefs being net emitters of carbon to reefs being net uh, sequesters of carbon and to studies that are really undetermined in the results. And again, this is really context dependent as well. So those folks who have done this research are, are finding that the ability of oysters to capture and store carbon are really dependent on things like the, the depth of the reef, the salinity regime, the size of the reef, the location, you know, in terms of latitude where the reef is located. So this will definitely be an ongoing area of research into the future. So oyster reefs and oyster reef restoration has really come forward as, a, as now a quite common way of ameliorating the effects of habitat loss because oysters, natural reefs have been subject to a number of stressors that you can see here, things such as storms and destructive harvests and substrate loss, water quality and quantity, uh, chemical and oil spills and pollution, as well as disease. So habitat restoration is really um, built upon the fact that we have learned how um, imperiled this marine ecosystem is. So folks are aware of this now, but maybe 15, 20 years ago, it was quite unknown that oyster habitat loss was so severe across the world. So there were some studies that were done um, showing that oyster reef loss is really greatest or one of the greatest among marine habitats compared to pre-human exploitation levels. So in fact, oyster reefs or native oyster reefs are now considered functionally extinct in many areas of the world. This is where oyster reef restoration has come in as one of a suite of tools that resource managers and practitioners, conservation practitioners can use to replace lost economic and ecosystem benefits. So for example, oyster reef restoration really in its early days was focused most often on enhancing oyster populations for commercial harvest. And this is still the target of a lot of resource management agencies is to support the commercial harvest of oysters in their states. Oyster reef restoration also now has a complementary function, which is uh, rebuilding these lost ecological benefits, some of these services that I have already talked about. Reef restoration approaches can vary based on the problem that has uh, caused your reef loss in the first place um, or has prevented your reef from naturally um, uh, maintaining itself. So um, one way of replacing uh, these lost benefits is if you're in an area where there's substrate limitation. So if there are natural populations of oysters within the area that can produce larvae that can populate a new reef, but there's no hard substrate, those fun fundamental building blocks are missing. Therefore, those larvae have not nothing to attack you. That type of restoration is the simplest. Essentially, you find the right places and at the right times, you put substrate back in to provide that, that scaffolding for the young oysters to attach to. On the other hand, if you're in a situation where you're recruitment limited, meaning that your oyster populations are degraded to the point where they're unable to provide larvae to populate uh, the substrate that you would put into a, an, into a bay or a coastal area, then you would want to work with a hatchery, for example, to create seed oysters, which are individual oysters that are pretty tiny, like maybe the size of your pinky fingernail or varying around that size. Or they can take oyster shell, like you see here in this picture, and they can set those juvenile, or sorry, those larval oysters directly onto the oyster shell. We call that spat on shell. And in either case, those seed oysters or those spat on shell 
can then be used to as a veneer of living oysters to jumpstart restoration at uh, or to jumpstart the oyster population at your restored site. But I'm going to focus on this area of substrate limitation where we've used substrate replacement um, as a technique to restore reefs, which is most common probably in most places throughout the Gulf of Mexico. So once you've decided on your reef restoration approach, you've, you understand why reef loss is occurring, how do we know where to go in and restore? So you have money available to you, maybe you wrote a grant or maybe you have some conservation dollars that are, are available to you and you wanna do a good job on in investing this money. Folks around the Gulf have taken up this question and have tried to provide tools that can help direct good investments of restoration dollars. In Texas, what we've done is we've developed a restoration suitability index, which is a, a, a mapping tool that integrates over 30 years of water quality and oyster data from our resource management agency, which is Texas Parks and Wildlife. And the idea is to provide this guide uh, to um, better understand the best places for spending restoration dollars and ensuring reef sustainability. And I'm going to just show some snapshots of some of the maps that we have available, but I just want to make you aware that all of these maps and, and an explanation are available at oysterrestoration.org. And you feel free to download any of these resources directly from that site. So one of the types of maps that we've created here is to indicate historical reef quality. So this is a map of San Antonio Bay or the Guadalupe Estuary in Texas. And all of the purple color in here you can see are oyster reefs. And what we've done here is we've created a reef, a reef quality index, which is essentially just a ratio between live oysters and dead oysters. And what you can see here is that oyster reefs that are colored sort of more of a bright purple are a higher quality, meaning that there's been more, um, there have been more live oysters present on these reefs over the 30 years, and also that there's been lower variability in the number of live oysters on these reefs. So we don't want to choose reefs that are sort of boom and bust in terms of where we would want to spend restoration dollars. We want to find areas that really seem to be more consistent in their support of oyster populations. So this is the reef quality. These maps are available for each of the bays in Texas. Next, we looked at oyster recruitment. And so this is looking at SPAT now. And in Texas, the way that Parks and Wildlife measures SPAT is to look, the, look at the mean number of SPAT per oyster shell. And they do this for five dead and five live oysters per sampling trip. So what we're looking at here, the lighter colors, the yellows indicate reefs that have more SPAT per oyster shell. The more reddish colors indicate fewer SPAT per oyster shell. So this can indicate that there's greater recruitment in some areas of the bay than others, and you may want to target those areas for replacing substrate. Um, this can also be used for restoration monitoring. So if you build a reef and you're monitoring it and you're looking at how many spat are on that reef, you can use this tool to see if you're within the ranges that you would expect. And then lastly, we've integrated water quality, historical water quality throughout each of the bay systems, because sometimes you don't want to restore right next to an existing reef. Sometimes you may want to seek out another location, and this can help show you the long-term water quality trends and how supportive they are of long-term sustainability of reefs, where here you have the darker blue color is the highest um, suitability for reef restoration, and then the reddish colors are the lowest. And then just a quick snapshot, if you go to the website, you can see that this is available for all of the different bays in Texas from Louisiana down to Mexico. So just briefly, I want to just highlight some of the restoration work that's been done in Texas recently. So we've restored over 20 acres through my group at the Heart Research Institute. Uh, eight acres was restored in Aransas Bay, which is in the Texas coastal bend. This is an aerial image of the different mounds. Um, they're adjacent to Goose Island State Park. Um, this reef restoration looked at different substrate types and indicated that artificial substrates of a variety of sources are useful and um, can allow uh, oyster recruitment and survival just as well as oyster shells. We've restored six acres in Copano Bay, which is also in the Texas coastal bend. I just wanted to highlight this picture that shows that one month after restoration of, these reef, of this reef, you can see these sort of striped things through the haze of the Texas uh, bay waters. These are um, sheep's head that had come in and were already feeding on this reef just one, one month post restoration. Also, we've restored five acres in St. Charles Bay, which is also in the Texas coastal bend. 
The interesting thing about this reef was that this picture that I just popped up here, this is Hurricane Harvey, that arrow shows St. Charles Bay. This hurricane passed over our restored reef about two weeks after construction was complete. And we, are, we were very happy to report that the reef structure stayed intact. And also it appeared that the salinity drop uh, spawn, uh, spurred those oysters to spawn uh, in the natural populations. And we saw that this restored reef was really wrapped up in spat just uh, a month after restoration which is what we're showing here. So increase in the size of oysters on the restored reef compared to the reference reef, which saw some mortalities. Texas Parks and Wildlife also is making incredible investments in oyster restoration. So over 500 acres and over $12 million have been restored by our state agency, a variety of bay systems, as you can see here on the map. As are groups like the Nature Conservancy, I just wanna point out that they are also um, performing large-scale restoration in Galveston Bay, Matagorda Bay in the mid-coast, and Copano Bay in the Texas coastal bend. Um, if we zoom in on this one in Copano Bay, you can see these polygons on the map correspond to these aerial images of restoration. And then lastly, sometimes we forget about this as scientists, but I think it's important to remember that we often are doing large-scale habitat restoration that involves barges and cranes, but we also do small-scale restoration with people, and it helps to remember that habitat restoration is about a lot more than just habitat. Thanks so much.